Today we're here for another wonderful talk. Uh, Clifton Sankofa, uh, Sankofa Classroom, is an educator and a writer. And he'll be talking about um, the complexities that we think about culturally, uh, financially, about diabetes. Um, such an important topic, health advice to, to really dive into. And so without any further ado, Clifton Sankofa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Oh, oh whoops. Uh, thank thank you. you. Excuse me. Where are my manners? My bad. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Uh, my name is Clifton Sankofa, and I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see such a diverse group of people who uh, maybe might hear something new today. So um, in tradition, before I get started, I would like permission from an elder. So do I have permission? Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, as I said, can, and can I move around as I'm doing this, or is it better from here? All right. My name is Clifton Sankofa. I'm a man of many hats. I come to you today uh, as a servant. I want to talk about what's passionate to me, and I want to talk about why it matters to me, and I hope that by sharing that, it will matter to you. Um, I write for a site called Everyday Power. If you ever want to feel inspired or read some cool quotes or angel numbers or anything like that or anything health or hip-hop related, you can check me out over there. I became an educator around 20 years ago um, and what inspired me was this idea that uh, in melanated communities in across the country, we find that preventable diseases and autoimmune diseases uh, come at very high rates. And oftentimes, um, communities uh, like my community, uh, we are given food and we are given customs and we're given you know, access to certain things and ways of seeing the world that don't always resonate with our health. So what we do at Sankofa Classroom is we show people how to make their favorite food from whatever genre you like, and we make it either vegan or vegetarian, and we just flip it a little. So the flavor and the connection is still there, but some of the stuff that maybe you don't want it's not there. This is why I'm here. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm an educator, I'm a writer, I'm a school leader, and I'm an autoimmune enthusiast. Um, I don't mean enthusiast as this, it's, I'm so excited about autoimmune diseases. I'm an enthusiast because my entire life has been shaped by autoimmune conditions. Now I come from New York, I was born in the 80s. Um, and there's something called the crack era that a lot of people are aware of. And I'm a product of that environment. I lost both of my parents to one of the ultimate autoimmune con conditions, which was AIDS, uh, at a very young age. I also had no idea that I was a type 1 diabetic. And so since a child, I've had wild symptoms. But when your parents die, you don't have anybody to care for you. No one's putting you in the system and educating you and supporting you. So I never understood why I was always so sweaty or why everywhere I go, every mosquito wants me or why I'm so thirsty all the time or why my weight would go up and down, or why I had tingling in my foot. And when you tell people you have these things and you look how I look, I've been to doctors many times who have just been like, well, we don't really know what's wrong. I don't know what to tell you. You don't look like you have diabetes. So I take a little pride when I wear this sensor. I hope you can see it. Because I'm okay with being the face of diabetes, because my world is right there. And because I have people to live for, it means I had to grow myself. I remember in high school, uh, hip hop has always been a foundational piece of my life. And I remember in high school, the first time I heard a song by a band called Dead Prez. And in the song, they open up by saying, I don't eat no beef, no dairy, no sweets, only ripe vegetables, fresh fruit and whole wheat. I'm from the old school. My household smell like soul food, bruh. Curry falafel, barbecue tofu. No fish though, no candy bars, no cigarettes, only ganja and fresh juice squeezed from oranges. Exercising daily to stay healthy. And I rarely drink water out the tap cause it's filthy. And I remember being just so open over this song and I couldn't believe that I was seeing melanated men on TV talk like this. And years down the road, it's crazy how everything comes full circle, this song would actually help me change my life. The lyrics to this song, having that reinforced back to me as an adult, caused me to question everything. So let's start with, well, what does it even mean to be healthy? Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. 
So let's ask the World Health Organization, and according to WHO, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of a disease or an infirmity. Men, let's say that one more time. Health is not the absence of a disease or an infirmity. So I was always told, well, your leg ain't broken, you all right. <laughs> that you don't have this, you're all right. And so sometimes we walk around thinking, well, my head isn't falling off, so I must be healthy. But that's not always the case, right? And so health has to be perceived as a holistic thing, all of you, all of us. So let's get into it. Right now, like right now, and I'm one of these people, there's 30 million people in the United States who are diabetic. 22 million people walking around with diabetes, either caring for it or not caring for it, and 8 million people who have no idea that they have an autoimmune condition. Now, when I say those numbers, people are throwing numbers at us all the time, right? But I want you to conceptualize that. 30 million people is more than the entire country of Australia. There's not 30 million people in Ghana. 30 million people is more than the whole nation of Venezuela. Can you think about that? Imagine whole countries. Imagine if it was a whole country of diabetic people. That's what we have. Um, but how does it affect here, right? We can look at the world and we can say, oh, X, Y, Z is going on. How does it affect Hawaii? Well, in Hawaii, diabetes affects the native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander populations at much higher rates than uh, white or Euro-American groups. In Hawaii, those of native origin die from complications due to diabetes at higher rates than other groups. Why? Now, there's no cut and dry answer. There's no, oh, it's because of this, it's because of that. So when we really start thinking about these things, we have to look at it from the whole, right? And if we were to just take, uh, and the numbers have increased, but you know, this is from 2014, these are the diabetes diagnoses in Hawaii from 10 years ago. Now, as you see, Pacific Islanders are almost at 15%, Japanese 13.6, Chinese 13, Native Hawaiian 12.8, and then white or European, 5%. And obviously, we're not trying to racialize anything, but a person has to ask, well, why does the data look like this? What is it about these groups that makes these numbers sometimes double and triple? Is it genetics? Is it culture? Is it something else? Well, there's a lot of factors that impact how autoimmune diseases impact different communities. Um, socioeconomic status, genetics, culture, healthcare systems, even environmental factors can play into how you contend with an autoimmune condition. So these are some of the reasons for diabetic disparities uh, in our lovely state. Um, again, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, they experience difficulty, and this isn't what I think, this is from the CDC, uh, they experience difficulty accessing healthcare. And I know that can be an uncomfortable conversation to have sometimes. These are uncomfortable things to talk about. I experience them all the time when I go to the doctor, and I'm not a Hawaiian or a Pacific Islander. But many of these things, like socioeconomic disparities, I've had, I've lived in Hawaii for going on nine years, and I've had 10 different endocrinologists. And once they were on the Big Island, one time. And that was only for like two months. And then every year, my endocrinologist changes so much, I get letters, oh, your endocrinologist has changed, you've got a meeting tomorrow. Wait, what? I got work, I don't have time for this. That's how bad it is. And often, if you can't get an endocrinologist, you work with nurses. And they're very knowledgeable, but it's nice to have a specialist, right? Uh, discrimination. This is a thing that's also sometimes uncomfortable to talk about, but it occurs. I experience it all the time when I go to the doctors. People ask certain questions that have certain implications and can even belie your intelligence because they have an idea about how you perceive your health. The things don't always match up. Um, I've been told, oh, you know, you're just, you're a brown man who didn't take care of himself. And I didn't even know I was diabetic. So I've worked really hard to be like this. I take great care of myself. But I had an endocrinologist tell me that to my face one day. And so these are things that you have to contend with when you're dealing with an autoimmune condition. Cultural preferences. We all go to the doctor differently. Not everybody goes to the doctor the same. What one person might feel comfortable sharing as a norm might be off the table for another person. 
but there's no collective way that uh, healthcare professionals talk to us. You get what you get, right? And so when you have a small pool of healthcare professionals to access, your options become limited, and then you can't really get around these factors. Now, some of the other reasons for the disparities, uh, smoking heavily increases autoimmune conditions, and uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations here have some of the highest prevalence of being everyday smokers. The shift in food practices is the thing that we're gonna be focusing on today. So anytime you have a group who eats food that's locally sourced, high in fiber, um, low in sugar, uh, artificial sugar, and that switches from food that's no longer locally sourced, food that's artificial, that comes from a can, that's frozen, that's freeze dried, that has salt and empty calories and artificial sugars, no one could contend with that. If you put any population in those changes, their health is gonna be impacted. And then there's the systemic factors. When you consider that people from this part of the world, unfortunately, when we look at the data, have some of the lowest levels of education attainment, lowest means of income, and the highest poverty rates. Now, if you put all that together, you have a recipe for disaster. But there's answers. Uh, let's consider your lifespan. We're all humans. We're all, we're, we all want to live happy lives and, and, and be fulfilled. Native Hawaiians make up about 21% of the state's overall population, but only about 11% of the population over the age of 60. So what does that tell us? Our lifespans in Hawaii are decreasing. I wanna say that one more time, because sometimes when you're talking to a group of people, you can say things and it might, the lifespans here are decreasing. All of us, because we all live here. But for certain groups, they're impacted more. And so the prevalence of diabetes in people age 60 or over is increasing rapidly for Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, Japanese, and Filipino people. So the question becomes, well, why? We all live on the same island. We have access to many of the same things. How could this be the case? Some of these aspects of life are out of our control, and that's a given. You can't control, you know, what your government decides to do with the land around you. You can't control how the economy goes up and down. You can't really control how you have access to certain foods. But there are other things that we can control. So I want to look at some case studies uh, and tell you a little bit about my experience and then we can compare it to what's happening here. I moved to Ghana in 2013 to become the principal of a small K-8, through uh, eight, the Youth Institute of Science and Technology in the Ashanti region. Beautiful, beautiful time of my life. When I got to Ghana, diabetes wasn't really a thing. Some people had it, but it wasn't like a popular conversation piece. Hey man, how's your diabetes going? You good today? All right. That didn't really happen. By the time I left Ghana, I was there for about two and a half years. By the time I was leaving, the number had went up to 6%. When I was doing this presentation and I looked into the data now, the number has risen to 8%. And I had to ask myself, well, hold on now. This is, you know, the country of my ancestors. What's happening here? Ghana is leading Western Africa in Westernization. They're bringing in McDonald's. They're bringing in KFC. They're bringing in Chick-fil-A. None of those things existed in Ghana 10, 20 years ago. As these things become more and more popular, we are watching in live time the autoimmune conditions are rising people are experiencing a lack of health that they didn't contend with before. So the factors here are the prevalence um, of urbanization, Western fast foods, and changes in diet and lifestyle. Does anybody recognize this image? I know I got a lot of learned minds in here. Yes, sir. Oh, well, I, I'm not sure if that's the name of it, but it is something else. Anybody else? This is an island off the coast of India. Yeah, that's the one. Yes. <laughs> These are the North Sentin Sentinelese, North Sentinelese Island. And I want to focus on this because we just talked about Ghana and what's happening to Ghanaians. The people who live on this island are one of the last untouched civilizations on planet Earth. And I am using the word untouched as a placeholder because that's the only word I think we could all maybe understand. 
The outside world has not come into this place. They do not have any contact with anyone who's not from their island and who's not in their tribe. And if anyone does try to go there, they fight voraciously to keep their island private. And so several years ago, this image became the point of contention for many, many, many talking heads. Because, you know, I was always taught, if you read news, just never read the comments, you know, because it's usually not great. Well, people are going back and forth because one side, the so-called outside world, the modern world, the one world's happening into right now, people were saying, well, who do these people think they are? You can't just stay secret, you're on earth. And the Sentinelese are saying, hey, listen, we don't want no problems, we just wanna do our thing, you do your thing, there's room for everybody. And so then it becomes a matter of, well, who's enacting their humanity? And the talking heads would go, well, who do they think they are, these primitive people? Who do they think they are, these people who don't want Western healthcare? They don't want x-rays, what do you mean? Well, I thought it was a really interesting comment. I was watching these two individuals kind of debate, I'll use the word, about the North Sentinelese. And when someone said they questioned their humanity, as in, well, what's wrong with these humans? Why don't they want us in here? And so I couldn't help but think, why is this island so isolated? It's off the Bay of Bengal. It's kind of in the Indian Ocean. It's accessible. And now you have all these like clout chasers and people on YouTube who just want to go and take a selfie over there. And you have journalists who feel, hey, it's my right to go and interview these people. Well, who's more human in this scenario since we're talking about humanity and the human narrative? The Sentinelese know what happens if they lose what they have in isolation. They're not dumb. They don't know any less than the rest of us do. They're enacting the human story. They know that if they let their borders down, it comes with the destruction of ancient sustainable values and lifestyle that still maintain their civilization till today. They know that it also comes with the destruction of the earth and they really wanna protect their piece of earth. They know that it comes with the mining of natural resources. They know that it comes with disease and they know that eventually it comes with extinction. So who's being human? I thought that was interesting. You can't see the forest for the trees. Do we have anybody who thinks that they can decode this uh, very old saying? What does it mean when you can't see the forest for the trees? Come on, I see. Oh, come on, give it to me. <laughs> so the trees is one part of the forest, right? The yes. forest is an ecosystem. Yes. There's all kinds of other life. The trees, it's a sustainable habitat. Yes. For all kinds of life. All kinds not of life. Trees and not just the usefulness that you can see from the trees. You better give me some of that. That's a really nice way of looking at it. Anybody else? That was beautiful. Well, it's the idea, and you know, zebras use this technique to protect themselves from lions all the time. I mean, that's why they're striped. A lion can sometimes have difficulty telling where one zebra starts and the next zebra begins. And the idea is that when you're too involved in the details of a challenge, you're unable to see the big picture clearly. You can't see the forest for the trees. Well, what if I were to posit that in 2024, we might be at the point in our evolution that it's time to reevaluate our relationship with what we think we know about death, health, and life. What's taken for granted is taken away. What's taken for granted is taken away. I know we like to think we know what death and life is. I know we like to think we know what health is. But do you? You know what makes you comfortable. And many of us are addicted to comfort, however that has to happen. So I put the parachute to remind you that if I say something that runs counter to maybe what you've heard, just remember, keep an open mind. If I were to ask anybody in this room, can you tell me the difference between a dead person and a living person? I guarantee all of you would say, oh, of course I can. I know what a dead person looks like. Do you? A couple weeks ago, at the lovely branch of Wells Fargo, I believe it's in Minnesota, uh, a banker signed into work on Friday, died at their desk, probably 10 minutes after signing into work, sat there all day sat there Saturday, sat there Sunday, Monday morning when the cleaning crew came in, someone said, what's that smell? 
for four one for four years, listen to me, for four days, an employee sat dead and nobody knew. People are working around this individual. People are around the cubicles and going through the desks. So I ask you, do you know the difference between a dead and a live person? Something to think about. It's getting harder and harder to tell the difference between the living and the dead. Now I say this as a joke, right? I'm not actually saying anyone's dying or your mortality is in question, but I am saying you should think about this. What we see in media and movies and television often reflects what's in the collective consciousness. And how many zombie shows are there out there? Way too many. What does that say? It says that we are fascinated with zombies. Well, what is zombie culture? No critical thinking, mob behavior, easily fooled. We can't even tell the difference between living and dead people anymore. Fela Kuti is one of my favorite artists. He has a song called Zombie, uh, and I, I, it's very appropriate. So a good way to assess where you're going is to look what's around you. Well, we're in Hilo. What's around you? Right now, right around the corner, a new dialysis center just opened. You know enough about the world to know that people invest in states based on what they think they're going to do, right? Nobody's investing in beet farms for New York City because they don't have beet farms in New York City, right? They invest in other things because that's relevant to that place. Well, Hawaii has 29 dialysis centers. Hawaii has 29 dialysis centers. So what that tells us is the individuals who are responsible for investing in this place believe the money is in your sickness. And that's not a very nice idea. And I gave the stats for New Hampshire and Maine because they have similar populations to Hawaii. And look how many dialysis centers they have. Now ask yourself, is there any differences in the population of Maine and New Hampshire and here? Worthwhile. So what future do you want? I don't mean this as an insult. Every time I drive by KFC, the line is around the KFC, the drive through lines around the KFC. Now, whatever, that has its own reasons for manifesting how it wants to manifest, but the proof is in the pudding. So you have to ask yourself, what future do you want? This one, I understand, it's accessible. You don't really have to do much. You might even think it's cheap. Well, not really, but it is a heavy price. And I know this one might require some different modes of being. It might even require <gasps> labor. But one of these is beneficial to you, and one of, them, one of them is not. And I know I don't need to tell you. So your health is in your hands. You're the steward. How are you going to enact your culture? Are you going to welcome what kills you? Or are you going to fight for what is worthwhile? What's taken for granted is taken away. So I want to play a game, actually. Uh, we're going to do a little game. And since you're all seated so wonderfully, Maybe you could use maybe groups of three or groups of four, depending on your row. So I want to do a couple things here. I want to teach you some AAV. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's African American vernacular. I know you have pidgin here. I know you have all your different languages here. We're going to do some African, African American vernacular together. And we're going to play a game called, hey, yo, what you going to bring to the cookout? All right. So the way this game works is we're going to give you a couple minutes. You're going to pick the people to your left and your right. And all I want you to do is pretend you're going to a cookout, and I want you to think of a dish. That's all I want you to do. So here's the rules. Come up with a food you want to bring to the cookout. Think of the ingredients of that food. In your group, practice your African-American vernacular and say, hey, yo, what you going to bring to the cookout? Share what you bring and share the ingredients. After everyone has shared, I want you to think long and hard about the ingredients and just yes or no. I don't want any other answers except for yes or no. Do you believe these ingredients promote health or promote sickness? Okay, so let's take five, 10 minutes. Let's get to know each other a little bit. I'm gonna come around because I wanna know as well. And let's find out, hey yo, what you gonna bring to the cookout? All right, so here we go. Here, oh wait, does anybody have any questions about that? I'm sorry, I need to check for understanding real quick. I think we're good. All right, cool, cool, cool. We'll get back to business. 
Now, aside from being able to converse with such intelligent and wonderful people, I really liked the responses I was hearing uh, for what we would bring. Um, would anybody like to share what, what they gonna bring to the cookout? Can we get, can we get a meal? Yes. Roasted veggies. Roasted veggies. Okay, okay. Yes. Ponset with chicken. And, and she said not pork. All right. She said chicken. So she said, you know, it's good. Yeah. We'll get into that. Yes. My wife, she bought me this new smoker uh -huh. for Christmas. Right. She bought me the smoker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so smoking. And so lately I've been really into smoking fish and did some smoked ahi yesterday oh. and some smoked oxtail. So OK. I'll, I'll bring it. I'll You're going to hook them up. Bring All right. Them. All right. Yes. I was thinking, as we were discussing, what's also good, local good, is uh, breadfruit potato oh, salad. It's yeah. the best. It's so good. With I love them. And olive oil, that would matter. Yes, yes. Okay, I like these ideas. I didn't know we had so many chefs. So, as you were saying your ingredients aloud, did you feel that they promoted health or did they promote sickness? Now, you don't have to answer that. I just want you to think about it. So, <clears throat> now, I, I, before I even get into this, I want to just, well, no, I'll save the story for after. Let's get into this. So, and before I even talk about it, ask yourself whose tradition. I understand that prior to Western contact, the diet here was much different. So when we talk about what's traditional, right, I really get that word on a deep level. So I, end, I put contemporary in parentheses, okay? But when I came here, and I'm, a, I'm an educator, so like, you know, I work with a lot of middle school and high schoolers, and they love their food, you know? And so, I often look to children to see what a culture is doing. So what are the children doing? That tells me a lot. What are the children eating? That tells me a lot. And when I look up here, I see Musubi, I see Loco Moco, I see Manapua, I see Simon, I see Malasada. When you look at these items, what do you notice? Just visually at first. A lot of, yes. The colors, brown, yellow, gray, undetermined color, uh, pinkish, pinkish, reddish, right? I'm a type one diabetic. If I were to have any one of these foods, I'm asking for trouble in a day. I, I don't eat meat as it stands, but if I did, if I were to have any one of these foods, it would be a tough day for me. I'd have to take a lot of insulin, which is something I try to avoid. So what does that tell you about the foods that we have access to? Well, I'll let you come to your own conclusions. But I can't just focus on Hawaii. What about my community? Well, let's get to that. Because before we get to that, I want to talk about this. Because every time I show people this, they say, yeah, but those aren't the healthy foods. And then they start naming these foods. <laughs> and so huli huli chicken, garlicky shrimp, fish tacos. I'm not saying there's not good ingredients in those meals. But what I am saying is, Foods that might seem healthier often are disguised in oils, processed white flours, additives, sodium, and other natural flavors. That's why they taste good to your palate, not because you're eating the healthy thing. So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with that one. Now, when I look at my own community, uh, yeah. Now, Jackie Gomes. Can you tell me about the colors again? What colors do you see? Same, notice any parallels? I, I, I almost wrote my, one of my theses on the, well I did write one of my theses on the connection between African American and Hawaiian culture and all the parallels. Food is another one that there's a lot of common themes. Again, red, brown, yellow, golden, fried. I, I was on the phone, I got a nephew, he lives back in New York. I said, hey man, what'd you have for dinner? He said, fried. fried. I was like, Fri fried what? No, I had fried, oh, uncle, I had fried. Fried is a thing, right? And so, this is what happens in my life and in my household and in my family <laughs> when I show up to the cookout with a salad. This is how my family responds. And it's hard for me not to take it personal. 
It's hard for me not to take it personal. So what happens when someone brings a salad to the cookout? Yes. Did they have what? Croutons? My salad? No, I didn't put the croutons. Because they get soggy, you gotta add that at the end. I'm a salad connoisseur. You can't put the croutons in the, in the bowl and serve that, it'll be ruined. So this is what happens when I bring salad to the cookout. Um, and it's a challenge, because why, why? So when you look at that right there, I already know what it's doing to your eyes. I know what this is doing to your eyes. And for all my like large steak eaters, I don't got a problem with it, but there's a reason why when they advertise steaks, they always put veggies on the side of it because this is the part that the eye can't help but find appetizing. This is sending messages to your brain that say, oh, that's what I need. So when you go to the cookout, do you find yourself going to that? Or do you find yourself Go into that and that. And I know what we all like to do because I've done it myself. We love to posit that we're nice and healthy in public and that we always make good decisions. <laughs> That's why one of the best things that happened to me today is a very, very intelligent member of the audience said, well, am I naming something that like, I think is healthy or like what I would normally do? And that was the honest truth. And that's what we have to not be afraid of. These are our choices. So this is a culture story. My oldest boy is four, he'll be five in November. My youngest boy is two. We had, their baby, we had the baby showers at La Pohoi Hoi Point when I used to live in Hamakua. Some of the people in this room were at that baby shower. I worked so hard on the food for that day. Breadfruit dishes, papaya dishes, mushroom dishes, noodle dishes, every salad you could imagine, every type of garlic bread, every type of hummus. And I went home that day with a lot of food. And do you know why? It's because the people in my life are local folks from the schools that I work at. And that's not how they eat. And so that day taught me a very valuable lesson about my intention and what I'm trying to do. A lot of food got wasted that day because I wasn't speaking the language of the people who were in my life that day. We were having a whoop, not hearing you, whoop, not hearing you. And I had to take that. But then I saw this uh, when I was studying uh, here in Hawaii. I was, I was in graduate school and we would always have these like luncheons and they would always say, is there anybody who's a vegetarian or a vegan so we know? And I would say, oh yeah, me, me, me. And say, okay, we'll order one of those plates for Cliff. Everybody else is getting the normal food. When the normal food shows up, everybody who asks for the normal food wants to act like, oh no, I'm a big time salad eater. And then I never get no salad because they eat it all. I had to meet people where they were at, right? So these things were lifetime examples of how cultures don't always align and sometimes we're not telling ourselves the truth. So how does culture play a role in autoimmune conditions? Managing diabetes can be highly challenging for people whose diets promote autoimmune disease. Industrial foods have been staples in our households, but what's marketed as convenient and cheap comes with a steep price on our minds and bodies. I know you think you're saving a dollar, but you're paying. What happens when we associate culture with foods that promote disease or lack of health? Many foods we consider traditional increase autoimmune diseases and preventable symptoms. Now, I don't wanna to have to go back a bunch of slides, but I already explained all the things that are stopping people from being in alignment with their health. This is the one thing we're in control with, how we enact our culture. It was very, very hard showing up to the cookouts with salads. It was, I'd get made fun of by my closest friends. They tell me, oh, why you wanna eat rabbit food? Oh, why are you eating like such and such? Oh, what's wrong with you? Oh, you lost your soul? You don't want no ribs? You lost your soul, brother? Nah, I got a family to live for. So I gotta make choices that promote my life. And so it is hard to say this because it's hard for me, it might be hard for you, do the food practices of your culture promote health? Well, if it's Musabi and Simon and Manapua, we know the answer, right? So when people come to my barbecue and my family shows up to the barbecue, that's what they do. When I come out with all the plates and they, oh, Cliff, you made the food, everything's ready. And I take everything off and it's all vegetarian. Those are the reactions that I get and not from children, adults. So let's talk about mind and body. When you spend time suffering, it causes a densification or a hardening of the mind and body. 
And if you want to see a quick example about that, do something you don't like. Pick an activity that you don't like and watch how slow time goes. Time begins to densify. Things are less fluid because you're doing something you don't want to do. Well, you don't think your body has any of those ideas or thinks like that? So similarly, many forms of aging, inflammation, they come from a place of burden. So the energies of burden or suffering or complaining, they dehydrate the body's life force. It's a burden when you ask your body to have to deal with things that it's not supposed to deal with. So when you suck the life force out of a body, naturally it's gonna age. So I come to you as a person who manages type one diabetes every day. I have to work so hard to stay alive. I had to change my behaviors, my belief systems, my habits, my food choices, my friend circles, my family relationships, and ultimately how I choose to enact my culture. If I didn't make that change for myself, I would have been on a different course and I might not be standing here talking to you right now. I didn't even know I had diabetes fully diagnosed until I was like 33 years old. When we look back, I, as early as four, the doctors would say, oh, his, his urine is strange. Oh, we got strange readings with this, but there was nobody to care for me. So I'm so grateful that this body would allow me to be resilient for all this time, and now I can do something about it. So let's find comfort in discomfort. At first, it was hard being the only one eating a salad. At first, it was hard telling people telling me that, you know, I'm not keeping it real no more. Oh, you ain't keeping it real, man. You over there eating a salad like a sucker. Come have a burger. All right, cool. Over time, though, it became easier. And eventually, I did it so much that my friends and family would be like, well, Cliff's coming. We should probably make a salad. And now, those same individuals, 20 years later, Cliff, how do I make a salad? I just came from the doctor and I got my blood work back and it's not looking good. You're an expert on who you are, just like I'm an expert on who I am. You're an expert at your narrative, I'm an expert at my narrative. So if we're enacting our culture, why not rewrite your narrative? Why not choose to be a superhero? Now this is the inner work. And I think that's probably an image that many people in this room recognize. And, you know, people could talk about superhero motifs, but we talk about culture, right? So who was there before Superman, Clark Kent? Well, this is my personal Superman. This is an individual from my culture. This is John Henry, the steel driving man, the man that proved that a machine can never outwork or outwit or outdo a human being. I wonder what he would say about AI today. That'd be interesting. Somebody should write about that. John Henry was a man who did not have much but arose to superhuman status because of his discipline. And whenever I think about how I need to be more disciplined, I think about what John Henry had to go through. I'm sitting here complaining I'm stuck in traffic. John Henry's underground doing railroads. One of us got it pretty easy in that scenario. So I use him as a litmus test whenever I'm feeling down on myself. But let's get a little bit more geographically relevant. When I moved here and I heard all of the tales and stories of Maui, I got emotional. Reading about Maui, having people sing about Maui, learning about Maui, the ability and the laser focus and the mischief, uh, mischievousness and the magic, it's such an incredible story. All of you are Maui. All of you are John Henry. But we do have to consider other things. Now, I learned about Maui through this brother right here. I'm sure if you don't know who that is, that's brother is. Now, the irony that I learned about Maui, who inspired me to want to take my diabetes more serious, is interesting, because if you know anything about brother is, his health suffered. He didn't get to be there for his daughter. He had one of the most amazing talents in the world, and we lost a national treasure because of what? how we enact our culture. How do I become a superhero? You can shift today. You can save yourself, your loved ones, your community. Health means balance, and balance means not eating all the time. Conditioning is real. We're conditioned to believe that we're supposed to eat all the time. It's not true. Our insides aren't even designed for that. Maui and John Henry became figures of inspiration because they had strength, discipline, and balance. If we want balance, 
all you have to do is look to your culture. We have to reach back and enact what promotes health. My name, my last name is Sankofa. It comes from Ghana. It means to reach back and grab what belongs to you. You also have the ability to reach back what belongs to you. And KFC doesn't belong to you. McDonald's doesn't belong to you. You know what belongs to you. So sometimes you have to step outside the norm. You have to be OK with people from your own community questioning your realness, your authenticity. Are you still keeping it real? You got to be OK with that. I know we've all been told this by either your mother or someone's mother. If everybody was jumping off a bridge, would you do it? Right? Every time you do something with your friends, oh, they was all doing it. Well, if they all did it, would you do it? We know the answer. So different times come with different challenges. Um, during the time of people like John Henry or Maui, we had diseases of deficiency. Too little water, too little food. We don't have that now, at least not here. Now it's the opposite. We have diseases of abundance, where we drown in our own comfort. Has anybody ever heard of gout? Does anybody know gout's nickname? What do they call gout? What is gout also known as? The king's disease. The king's disease. Because eating like a king is not very good for you. So we're going to close with this. There's wisdom from the mouth of babes. Anybody in this room who says, well, I'm not really sure how I can make some of these changes. You were a baby once. And when you were a baby, you were free, you were unburdened. People gravitate towards you when you're a kid. People are on their best behavior around children. Why? It's because children are childlike. They make us better. If I said, act like a chicken, all of you know how to do that. You might do this, a little bit of this, or whoops, sorry. You know, make some noises. Well, I want to challenge you. I want you to act like a baby when it comes to food. And by act, I mean eat like a baby. So I don't mean, um, smearing your face or wearing a bib. But when you were a baby, you were limber, you were flexible, you were much less rigid. Why? The foods you were eating were light based. If you weren't having milk, you were having banana and carrot and sweet potato and broccoli. But how was it being served to you? In liquid form. If you want to reverse aging, if you want to decrease inflammation, if you want to support transforming reversible symptoms, Eat like a baby. You know how to do that already. When I say eat like a baby, make it fun. You can have sweet, you can have savory, you can be full, but you're going to help your body. If you want to be light, you have to eat light. Childlike, not childish. So eating like a baby means when food is artificial or oily or full of heavy ingredients or it's eaten too fast, like while you're driving, trying to get home or trying to get to the next thing, or it's not liquefied, it's natural. And over time, it clogs the body up. And when the body's clogged, it gets inflamed. And when it gets inflamed, bingo. Autoimmune conditions go <laughs> It's inflammation. So treat yourself with the same care as you would treat a baby. And if that's too much, just remember this, the Snickers bar effect. I don't think anyone's, I, I think I, I might have come up with this concept. Everyone in this room knows you would not give a little tiny baby a Snickers bar. You wouldn't. No one has to tell you that. It's wired in your DNA that you wouldn't do that. Why? Well, you know the child's system would go into shock eating a Snickers bar, but also little babies won't eat a Snickers because the babies know. So why do you think you're any different than the baby? You are not separate from the symptoms of what happens when you eat a Snickers bar. The same reason why you wouldn't give it to a baby is because of what it does to you. So treat yourself like a baby. Practical things you can do today, look to your culture. The more you look, the more you will find that your ancestors laid a framework for you to work with. Try not to eat past sunset. There's a reason why the world around you goes to sleep. Your body also naturally knows this. You have something called circadian rhythms. Your body knows it's supposed to slow down. Incorporate more light foods into your diet. Say, hey, one day a week. Oh, I'm going to have liquids today. And then maybe you could even fast one day a week. When you do this, not only does it decrease inflammation, but it also increases all the good stuff. So that's how you flip the script. If you want to survive, you have to make the choice. You're responsible for how you enact your culture. Thank you very much for your time today.